I've been assigned uh, five opportunities to address you over the next two months, which will lead us into the Christmas season. And uh, so I would like to do a five-part series on Matthew chapter 2. Matthew's the only gospel writer who tells us of the visit of the wise men and uh, from the east and their three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And he also tells us of three prophecies related to the coming of Christ uh, that are related to the three gifts in Matthew chapter 2. But here I want to expand on that to show you how Matthew 2 is really needed, a needed message for today. Years ago, I wrote several articles for Zion's Fire magazine back 20 years ago. And uh, I've kind of brought these uh, thoughts back and I've contemporized them so that we can uh, think about how this message uh, in Matthew 2 really affects us. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12 is what we'll be reading today. And if you would like to uh, find that in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 2, it's the story of the wise men. And uh, I want to read it and then to uh, talk about it. Matthew 2 begins this way. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written in the prophet, And thou Bethlehem, as the land in the land of Judah are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he, said to the, uh, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they, had, which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they, were, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Every now and then you hear a question spoken with a tone of bewilderment. What in the world is happening? What's this world coming to? And uh, that's usually spoken when something troubling happens or when we hear some uh, new manifestation of evil on the television. And uh, lately, however, it seems that the things have gone from bad to worse and the world is in a kaleidoscope of change. And every uh, day, moral decline has a new low. So uh, it says in 2 Timothy 3.13, as evil men and seducers shall become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, speaking of the last days. So what's this world coming to? The question is easily answered if you know the scriptures. The world is rushing headlong and with increasing velocity toward a new world order in which uh, Satan, satanic government and perverted religion shall be wed in uh, the opposition to our Lord Jesus Christ. This world is rushing headlong and with increasing velocity toward a crisis period, unprecedented trouble called the day of the Lord judgment in which God will pour out his wrath uh, against the godless system of man. This world is rushing headlong and with increasing velocity toward a collision with the omnipotent Son of God as he descends in power and glory upon the earth to put down all rebellion against his name and his sovereign authority. That's what this world is coming to. The Bible says so. So, what can we anticipate in the days ahead? Well, I expect more of the same. Only with increasing intensity and frequency. 
Uh, now, what does Matthew 2 have to do with all of this? Well, I would tell you everything. Uh, perhaps you will be surprised to discover how appropriate this passage is to the question, what's this world coming to? Uh, Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12, is one of the most beloved stories of the Christmas season. Uh, yet it's also a story of struggle and conflict. Conflicting ideologies, struggling monarchs in the midst of our beautiful story. On one hand, you have the joys of Christmas, wise, wise men bringing gifts to the young child Jesus. On the other hand, you have Herod, jealous of his political advantage, conniving and manipulating events for his own purpose. So incongruous. Christmas actually is the battle of the kings. Verse 1 says King Herod was there, the representative of the Western Imperial Roman government. Kings of the East came, their representatives of Eastern monarchs. And in verse 2 it says King Jesus was born King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And the purpose of all of this is control of Palestine. There's no harmony here. Battle lines are drawn, it is the battle of the kings. So let's consider two things. First of all, a historical understanding of this, and then we'll look at a prophetic understanding of this. First, the history of the kings in Matthew's account. In the battle of the kings, there is trouble in the world. Matthew's account of the Christmas story is a story of trouble, a story of conflict between kings in the land of Israel. King Herod was the official representative of the Roman government in Palestine. So let's talk about King Herod for a moment. The story opens with Rome in power, with Herod wielding the sword of Rome in Jerusalem. Herod is a descendant of Esau, an Edomite or an Idumean. Uh, history tells us that Julius Caesar appointed Herod's father Antipater, procurator of Judea under Roman occupation. Antipater managed to have his son Herod appointed as prefect of Galilee. There were guerrilla bands operating in the Galilee area, so Herod had to first of all begin to quell the bands of guerrilla fighters from the Jewish perspective against the Roman government, which he did. And then Parthians uh, from the east came and they invaded Galilee and drove Herod out and he had to flee for his life. He fled to Egypt and then caught a ride up to Italy uh, across the Mediterranean there and uh, when he got back to Italy uh, he met with the Roman Senate. In 40 BC he was declared to be the king of the Jews by Octavian who was Caesar Augustus and Anthony with the blessings of the Roman Senate. In 39 BC, just a year later, he went back to Palestine with an army of the Roman, the Roman military. He uh, fought for several years with the Parthians and finally drove them out. So in 37 BC, he had established his kingdom in Palestine. He got it with great effort. He pretended to be a friend of the Jews. He married Mariamne, who was the brother of Aristobulus, the high priest, and heiress to the Jewish Hasmonean house. And yet he was a very cruel, ambitious, and jealous man. Uh, he was ruthless in his desire for position and power. I want you to consider the type of man he was, antichrist from the very core of his being. Aristobulus, the high priest, Mariamne's brother, was a potential threat to Herod, so he had him drowned. And then he provided a magnificent funeral and pretended to weep. He had Mariamne herself killed, then her mother, then two of his own sons. Five days before his death, he had his a third son executed. And uh, he gave orders to be executed at his death, uh, that uh, the distinguished citizens of Jerusalem would be arrested, that uh, they would be executed at his death. Now he knew that no one would mourn his death. 
So he wanted mourning in Jerusalem, and that's why he gave that order. We know from this passage here, a little after what we read, that he slaughtered all the male children in Bethlehem, two years old and younger, to remove any threat to his throne. That's the kind of man Herod was. He was a man of sin, a beast out of the sea. He was a willful king, the official representative of Western Imperial Rome in the land of Israel. That's the first king. There's a second set of kings, and that's the kings of the East, so-called. They were the official representatives of the Eastern powers. Legend has it that they uh, were kings, that there were three of them. Their names were Caspar, Bethazor, and uh, Melchior. And uh, some suggested he was, uh, they were the sons of Noah, so one is represented as an Ethiopian, a dark-skinned person. They were not officially kings, however. Verse 1 said they were from the east. That's all it says. It actually means from the rising. And uh, there were possibly more than three. We don't know how many there were. But there were three gifts, so we assume three persons. And it's probably more akin to that because they all went into the little peasant house of Jesus in Bethlehem. And they couldn't all fit if there were 12 or 20. So probably three. And uh, they first appeared in the 7th century A uh, BC. They weren't officially kings. Uh, 7th century BC in Eastern Mesopotamia. They became powerful and prominent uh, persons. And uh, they were advisors to the Babylonian and Medo-Persian uh, emperors. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 48, we read a surprising statement. Daniel lived in Babylon. He was a captive taken from Israel to Babylon, and he lived there, and he uh, was with his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they uh, were being trained uh, to be governors uh, by Nebuchadnezzar, which was common practice then to take uh, the leadership of the uh, captured country uh, to act on your behalf, and it would go well with the people they were governing. And so they were being trained for that. And then uh, Daniel uh, interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar the king. It was an important dream, very important to Nebuchadnezzar. And when he solved the problem and, and uh, told the dream, it says in Daniel 2.48, Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men, the magi of Babylon. Daniel was a chief magi. And his writings were revered. Daniel's prophecies of the four successive empires in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 must have been impressive to these magi coming 500 years later, which had already transpired, and they must have been astounded at his ability to predict the future in that way. Also, they would have studied the writings of Daniel, the chief magi. Nebuchadnezzar's dream was, Thou, O king, as Daniel gave the interpretation, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form of it was terrible. This image's head, uh, head was of gold, uh, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest still a stone cut out without hands, which smote the image upon its feet. There were iron and clay, broke them to pieces. Then were the iron and clay, the breast and the silver and the gold, broken to pieces together, became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, filled the whole earth. And in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it had broken pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation of it sure." 
This was Daniel's interpretation. 500 years later, these magi are reading Daniel, one of their chief magis, in the historical record of their country. Daniel himself had a dream in Daniel 7. It says in verse 9, I beheld till the, till the thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days did it, uh, did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head uh, pure wool, his, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. I saw in the night vision, and behold, the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near with him, before him. And there was given him dominion, now listen to this, dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. They would have known that passage. They would have known the prediction of God in Daniel's dream that there was coming one who would rule the world. This was in their mind as they were thinking their thoughts during this time in their history. They would have studied the timing of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 25, it says 70 weeks are determined, 70 periods of seven are determined upon your people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins. Now, though therefore understand, and from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. The starting point is given by Daniel. The time period is particularly laid out. Seventy periods and sixty-nine periods would be the time when he would come. They would know all of this. They would understand it. They would have studied it because it was their chief magi of 500 years ago. They would also have read Daniel's scriptures. What did Daniel read? Well, he read the Jewish scriptures. Uh, the books of Moses were foundational to the Jewish scriptures, and in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, another prophet of Mesopotamia is said to exist. And he said, there shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Putting it all together, they realized the time was now for the three magi. Uh, this awesome king who would rule the universe to be born in Israel. They were looking for the celestial sign. They were looking for a star, which uh, Balaam had said would come. They were looking for a star. And when they saw it, they knew exactly what it meant. So uh, they loaded up their caravan in Mesopotamia and began the long journey around the fertile crescent to Israel, which would have taken them by camel a little over a year. They had a deep desire to worship this king of all kings who would rule the universe. The royal entourage of noblemen from Parthia came to Jerusalem. They were Herod's nemesis. He had fought the Parthians for two years before he could drive them out. Now here were people from Parthia coming, royal entourage. They arrived in Jerusalem not to see Herod, but in search of a newborn king of the Jews. Herod must have seen this as a severe threat and a possible alliance between the Parthians and the Jews. Wise men were only on a personal visit. It was not official, but Herod envisioned it otherwise. In verse 3, Herod was troubled. Any time Herod was troubled, Jerusalem was troubled. They never knew what he was going to do. And uh, the reason they fe feared Herod's tactics was exactly what happened. He killed all the little children in Bethlehem to uh, guard his throne. That's why Jerusalem was troubled. Well, that's Herod. And that's the kings of the east. There's one other. The name is Jesus. He's the king of kings. In verses 2 and 11, Jesus, the King of kings, the King of the world, the King of the universe, the Lord of lords, the Son of God, the Lord of glory, is introduced. When the wise men looked at the young child, they saw the king 
of the chief magi's prophecy. Uh, they saw a stone cut out without hands that would crush the kingdoms of the world and grow and become a great mountain in the earth. The world sees a helpless little kid, an impotent Jewish boy. He probably was uh, between one and two years old at the time, which is why Herod killed all the children two years old and under to be sure he got him a little over a year. And they, they worshipped him. They went into the house and they bowed down and they worshipped this child. What do you see when you look at the child? A helpless baby, an impotent Jewish kid, a folk hero, a carpenter's son, a poor peasant baby. Well, that's what the world sees, and they mock him. But don't be afraid. Those who are wise put their confidence in that little child. They bow their knees before that manger, they worship the infinite form, and they give gifts to Jesus the Christ. That's the history behind this story. Now, I'd like you to see something of the prophecy. In the battle of the kings, there is triumph in Christ. There's trouble in the world, but there's triumph in Christ. Let me briefly summarize the rest of the story as we find it in Scripture. Letter A, the Word of God assures us of triumph in Christ. Verses 4 to 8 would indicate that. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the scribes of Herod's court found the prophecy of the coming Messiah where he would be born. Micah 5 verse 2, written hundreds of years before, pinpointed the exact place of his birth. Even the pagan king had to acknowledge the truth. Herod had to acknowledge that was what it was. But there is another prophecy, and it is equally true. It's found in Psalm chapter 2, where it says, Why do the nations rage, and the peoples imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heaven shall laugh. He sh the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his great displeasure. Yet have I set my king, he says, on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they who put their trust in him. The word of the Lord assures us of triumph in Christ. And those who are wise put their confidence in him. The second thing I want you to see here, the heavens will declare the triumph of Christ. Verses 9 and 10, we had a star, we had it at the beginning. A star appeared in the heavens, heralding the birth of Christ. Origen in the 4th century BC said it was probably a comet. Well, a comet moves and then it's gone. Hepler in 1603 said it was probably Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation of Pisces. 12 years prior to the birth of Christ. Uh, a year later, it was joined by Mars, and that only happens once in every 800 years. So Kepler said that's probably what it was. Lots of guesses, astronomical calculations, suggestions have appeared over the years what this star is. But in chapter 2, verse 9, you will remember the star which they had seen in the east. They hadn't seen it for over a year. They saw it in the east, and they knew exactly where they needed to go because Jewish kings were always born in Jerusalem. So they headed to Jerusalem. They went there because that's where Jewish royalty lived. The baby of Daniel's prophecy would have to be born in Jerusalem. They had to ask Herod where it was. In verse 10, when they left Herod, the star appeared again. 
Uh, they hadn't seen it in a year, but there it was again. And that caused them to rejoice with exceeding great joy. They knew they were on track. They had never seen it for over a year, and now there it was again. In verse 9, the star went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, you've got to admit, an actual star could not do that. That's why Dwight Pentecost, a uh, uh, celebrated professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, said it had to be an angel or the Shekinah glory. Angels are represented as stars in the book of Revelation. A star appeared. Secondly, a vision of the conflict. There is a vision of the conflict in Revelation chapter 12. Let me read that to you in Revelation 12 verses one and following. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. And that's uh, an evidence of uh, the angels being driven or uh, uh, drawn by uh, Satan to, to the earth and uh, did uh, cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. Who was that? That was Herod and dwelt by the demon of hell, the dragon. Then it goes on to say in verse 5, And she brought forth a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's directly out of Psalm 2. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared by God. The first and second advents here in Revelation 12 are blended into one account. The birth, that is the rule, one continues in history. The birth and rule. And then that one continues in history and prophecy and brought together here in Revelation 12. A vision of the woman who had uh, uh, a wonder with the sun and the moon and the f uh, stars at her feet. That's a vision right out of Genesis chapter 27 by uh, Jacob, or by Joseph. In verse 2, the woman gave birth to a child. That is verse 2 of Revelation 12, the birth of Christ. In verse 4, the dragon, Herod, he devoured her child. He tried to. The events of Matthew 2, Herod was the embodiment of Satan. In verse 5, many, Mary gave birth to Jesus. He would rule all nations with a rod of iron. Jesus was caught up into heaven and to his throne. The ascension, a prophecy of ultimate victory. It goes on in Revelation 12, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels. It says later the Satan, that Satan who deceived the whole earth, he was cast into the, heaven, into the earth, and his uh, angels were cast with him. One continuous scenario, we pick up the story of the second advent where we left off at the first advent in Revelation 12. Satan and his angels are overcome. His end is sure. His end is near. Christ is victorious in all people, all his people, with him. In verse 12, for the devils come down to you having great wrath because he has but a short time. Do you understand what the devil is doing in our world? This is why there is looting and killing. This is why there's uh, mayhem in the streets. This is why there is lying and deception everywhere. This is why the liberal agenda is committed to globalism, not nationalism, make America great again. Because this is the plan of Satan, to develop a new world order where his government will control your life. The devil's wrath is increased because he knows that his time is short. The devil's fingerprints are all over what's happening in the world. And it is going to get worse. The second advent will also include a sign in the heavens. Revelation 6, the sixth seal that is open, it says uh, the sun, the moon, the stars will uh, uh, go dark and will fall from heaven and will turn to blood. And the stars of heaven will fall unto the earth, not a glowing peaceful star like the wise men saw, but falling stars with a deadly effect. The entire sky will light up with a colossal meteor shower and Jesus will appear in the heavens 
and judge all of humanity. So that's what's going to happen in Revelation 6. Another colossal thing in the heavens, stars will be seen. Then you move out to Revelation 16, verses 12 to 16. A time that is coming when the kings of the earth, uh, of the east, will ride again, fulfilling Herod's worst nightmare. This time not led by God, but by the demons of hell. Not personal worship of, godly, of, the, uh, of the godly magi, but a great army with hostile intent to defeat the Western imperial power of the Antichrist and gain control of the Middle East. It will be the Battle of Armageddon, where once again it will be East against West for the control of Palestine. But in Revelation 19, it all comes to a head. Christ will descend from heaven upon them all. The baby has grown to be a man now. The infant is the glorious king of the universe. The time of reckoning has come. The stone cut out without hands is falling upon the kings of the earth, and they will be crushed beneath the weight of his words. In the battle of the kings, there is triumph in Christ. Let me bring this to a conclusion as we wrap up our thoughts here together. Persons who are wise pursue Jesus Christ to worship him. The wise men sought Christ at great expense to themselves, and when they found him, they worshiped him. They saw Jesus Christ in his humility as a little child. Uh, yet with their hearts, they saw the ruler of the universe. They gave no gifts to Herod, neither did they worship him, but they gave both gifts and worship to Jesus Christ. Years ago, I was at a banquet with junior hires. Everyone had eaten, and uh, they were on a break, and they were all standing out in the foyer area, the girls over here and the guys over there. And one of the guys, in typical junior high fashion, let out a loud belch. <laughs> and the girls in mass turned and looked with great disgust. <laughs> and this guy looked back at the girls and he said, what did you expect? Chimes? <laughs> you know, folks, the world is bent on lying and deceit and killing and looting. What did you expect? Chimes? <laughs> That's where we are today with all the mayhem and rioting and political intrigue occurring all around us, we need to keep our focus on Jesus. Christ is our hope. He is our savior. He gives us confidence for a blessed future. He is the one who controls our destiny. He's the only one who can make everything right. He's the one who will one day rule the earth and justice will once again be in righteousness. We worship Jesus. We place our trust in him. The wise men did not listen to the counsel of the world. They did not listen to the counsel of Herod. They went another way. Well, we also need to go another way. Don't get caught up in all the mayhem that's around us. It is to be expected. But our hope is in Jesus Christ. He's the one that will save us. And one day we will celebrate the kingdom along with these amazing, courageous men, the Magi. As we all bow down and worship the Lord of glory, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Father, I pray you'll seal these thoughts to us and help us to realize that in the story of the wise men, there is the story of our times. Help us to be wary of all that's going around us. Help us not to be naive. But Father, give us a true perspective of keeping our eyes on Christ. He is our only hope. Not a political party. Not uh, special things that are going to happen by the government. Father, I know and... We all should know that uh, evil men and seducers become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We are watching it take place right before us. 
Help us, Father, not to get caught up in it all. Help us to go another way. Help us to seek Christ, who is our only hope. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.